So who is John Angel? Buy an Onyx RCR, leave it alone for the first 30 days, and then go sicko mode. <laughs> do it, do it, race a Tesla, I've done it, it's fun. That's coming right up. Hey everyone, my name is Rick Cordero. Welcome to Run Playback, where we help you with video and tech tips to lead a more efficient and affordable lifestyle. Let's be creative and save money at the same time. In this video, we'll be talking with John Angel, one of the most trusted names for all things Onyx. John also pioneered a growing all-inclusive e-bike community in New York City. Want to know how John grew his following within NYC e-bike culture? Stick around to find out. We're here at Riverside Park on the west side of Manhattan in New York City. Today we'll be talking with John Angel, an e-bike influencer and curator of the most popular and organized group rides in New York City. He's also the owner of JohnAngel.NYC, a website dedicated to supporting the growing Onyx RCR community. So let's get to it. This is so wild. Let me, let me, let me, yeah. let me like get through these questions because it's, it's, it's so great. <laughs> go for it. Um, well, yeah, it's basically, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, can you tell us who you are and what it is that you do? My name is John Angel. I'm known for working on the Onyx RCR, uh, running some communities, helping online and helping people in person too. It's something that I ran into and uh, I went down the rabbit hole and I enjoy it. Tell us, you know, how you discovered the Onyx and, um, and what were you doing before you got into e-bike culture? So right out of college, I was already doing management at IBM. Uh, I moved on to Microsoft and Accenture. And at Accenture, some of my coworkers talked me into leaving the company. Cushy job, great situation to start a company. I was out one night with a girlfriend and we saw this e-bike just zip by us. It didn't look normal, it was, it, was, it was too fast. Turns out that I had to order it online and wait a couple of months. Uh, but that impression, like watching that thing zip, I was like, is he safe? Is he gonna be okay? Should I get one of these? It looks illegal. Yes, I should get one. It was great. So recently there's been like this massive growth of e-bikes to fuel this industry of aftermarket products, accessories. So what were the problems that you were looking to solve specifically with the Onyx RCR uh, on your blog? And when I got my Onyx RCR, uh, interestingly enough, there was actually a problem with the Onyx RCR at the time. Not mine, all of them. Uh, and I was just really determined to keep the bike. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna force myself to learn this. I'm gonna take it serious. Uh, I started teaching myself everything. And luckily within the first month of owning it, I was able to teach myself how to fix this problem and then in turn share it with everyone. And it helped. None of it, nobody had to figure it out. I figured it out. And, that's how I started my blog. E-bikes, especially high-powered e-bikes, you know, they could be frustrating. If you don't have any DIY experience, if you've never wrenched something before, um, what made you want to create a resource to help Onyx owners? I kind of think of the Onyx RCR as they picked the parts for me. Now I've got possession of the parts. Now I can just, rather than shop for them, I can focus on learning about them. So I can learn about the battery, the controller, the motor, what the wire harness means, DC converters, uh, just e-bikes in general. Interestingly enough, everything I've learned about the Onyx has been very useful when it comes to working on other e-bikes. So in terms of the blog, why so much? Why so much effort? If I never wrote about it, never made a video, still would have been in my head. So I think there are people, a lot of people out there like me that have, if not more information in their minds than I do. I was just one of the ones that shared it. My attitude was, I'm having a great time. I'm solving these issues. They're not gonna get in my way. For me to just add a little bit, you know, to do, get into some more of the deeper details of battery balancing, you know, what does it mean when it does this? How do I approach this? Uh, should I be concerned about this or not? It's a cool thing, you know, I don't think of myself as somebody that helps people. I think of myself more as somebody that I enjoy being there for people. Um, and I, it's, it's really just a golden rule, you know, it's just, I'm doing the same that I would do for myself. New York City seems to be a really great place for many riders to, you know, engage with each other, meet up, uh, mainly due to the geography, because uh, Manhattan, 
you know, is, is just a few miles and all the boroughs are connected to it. Can you elaborate on like why New York City had such a quick growth in e-bike culture? I wanted to show people I was having a good time, what I was riding, what I was doing, and apparently a lot of people liked it. So now the e-bike community here that I started is huge, huge. Now it's in like different groups. You know, there's other people that want to do this too, that are attracted to this and want to have their stake in it. It's just been really great. It's, it's so many great options. It's, in, it's just insane. Um, keeping all those relationships, talking to all those people, I don't really know how I find the time. But I'm really into this. I want to show up. I really want to do all this. The city itself has been awesome. It's so great. Like the Onyxes here are legal. A lot of the other bikes as well too. Um, so many great resources. Uh, I actually, when I got my Onyx, I used to take it to the police stations to just get them acclimated. You know, it was it was a strange thing to do, but I'm like, if I can get them to focus on the spike, guess what? They're going to talk to each other about it, and it worked. So now there's eight NYPD officers that have Onyx RCRs. Let's talk about your ambitions to grow an all-inclusive e-bike community here in New York City. Because, you know, all-inclusive can mean diversity in all forms. Obviously, New York City, as a native New Yorker, you grow up here, you're just exposed to just so many different people. There is kind of like a toxic atmosphere that seems to exclude, you know, certain people. Uh, I think specifically women. You know, um, and that's that's in a lot of industries and communities. But how do you see this changing in the future? What starts fast ends fast. All new friendships take it slow. It takes a year, it takes two. Don't rush it. And just saying simple little things like that really helps out everybody. You know, because not everybody has maybe done this public stuff before, and we all think we could do it better. Um, and so for me, I, I share a lot of what I've learned and people ask me a lot of questions just like this also. I think for the future, talking for example about women, for me personally, and, and one man's opinion, I think we're finally getting into a place after three years where I can go to more different groups and say, this is a great time. You know, this is more stable now. Uh, things are far more natural. Everybody has a better sense of themselves than everybody else. We've seen that we can all respect our differences and get along, uh, but it's great because not only do we all have options, we have people we might want to spend more time with, but we're amicable. We, and the big thing is we have dialogue. So there's no burnt bridges here. And so it's just like you said about New York, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of the nature of it. The right thing for me to do is just to lean back and observe, understand, uh, hear what other people have to say, what they think, what they've learned from, and really take that serious. You know, where I think we're at a point where it could go either way, either it's gonna be an all boys club or it's gonna be more inclusive for everyone, where people will feel like these rides are like a safe space. Luckily, uh, I think as somebody a lot of people know, um, I do have expectations and standards of all the men in this community. And especially when it comes to women, treat them like you treat me, be cool be fair, be understanding. My girlfriend, for example, she's the only woman that I know of in the United States that can ride sicko mode. <laughs> I've had guys try this before on their own bikes and they're not like her. But I really hope that it's, women are gonna see that this is a great time, that, hey, the doors are open, come in, take over. I don't care, you know, and have fun with it. Let's compare and contrast the positives and negatives of high-powered e-bikes becoming more accessible to, to anyone and everyone. Uh, people who maybe probably, you know, should start on something smaller instead of like an Onyx uh, or someone who really doesn't have the DIY capabilities or even the space to like put something like this in their homes. There's a lot of people who financially probably shouldn't be buying a $4,000, $5,000 bike uh, and taking out loans to do so. It's a double-edged sword. Unfortunately, there are people 
that I don't think this is a good financial decision for them. I don't think they should really be riding, but the impression that we all make on each other here in the city is, it kind of really evens things out. So some of the worst riders, people that I worry for, people that I, I personally think this isn't for them, somehow we've managed to influence them to really come up. And so they're really, if I think about it, out of the 600 and something people I've met here, there isn't, there's not really anyone that I don't think should be on the bike, but there were people I did think about that in the beginning. Um, and they really did write by themselves first, um, and then write by me with learning, practicing, heating advice, and they've taught me too. Obviously you have a great reputation in terms of customer service and working with people, um, different personalities, but how do you work with someone who doesn't know what they want, you know, doesn't know what they're doing, is kind of stepping over certain boundaries, and require more hand-holding. Figure out quickly who you're gonna take serious and who you're not. And even when you don't take someone serious, offer them a measure of respect. And so, for me, when I talk to people, I don't have to personalize it. I don't have to form an opinion about them or feel anything about them. Um, I just have to understand what they think of themselves, which happens pretty quickly. And it allows me to help people. And yeah, occasionally somebody, oh, I've only had to, block two people in this whole time, you know? Uh, and, uh, but that's, those are people that I said, hey, I don't want to help you. This isn't my job. I'm not obligated to do this. Uh, and you're not respecting my wishes and you're blowing up my phone, you know? So back in March of 2021, Onyx had kind of a massive PR nightmare uh, on their social media, uh, where it seemed like the end of Onyx as a company and people were freaking out uh, online. And you know, you were sort of like the person that everyone was looking to, to say something because Onyx was sort of like had radio silence. Uh, and you were on the record, you know, telling worried customers to retain all the receipts and communication in case they had to do a chargeback. So yeah, let's let's talk about that moment in time. Not too long ago, pretty recently, I found out that it was actually a lot of it was my fault. It was my offers to buy the company that caused um, internal, some pretty serious internal rifts. So there were some people that wanted to sell me the company. Uh, my last offer was $80 million. And um, there's some people that didn't. And it just, I know that played a bigger role in that moment. So funny, looking back on that, I was like, oh wow, this, this is terrible, we're all disappointed, let's maybe consider like our, you know, our receipts and our options. And then the company was very courteous and called me and said, hey John, maybe don't say that, it's causing a lot of problems. So it kind of put me in a pickle of like, I like you, I like them, and this would be realistic here. Uh, there was a lot of people talking, a lot of speculation. Uh, and it was just all simpler. It was just basically two parties in the company that didn't get along, totally understandable. Uh, both sides, I heard both their sides and they were both telling the truth. They were just two parties that had their differences. You know, they should have just said divorce, amicable <laughs> different differences, what is it? that they say something like that. And I was upset because my phone blew up, you know, you know, for like days, like people were like, uh, what's happening? Why this? And I'm like, I don't own the company. It's not mine. I'm not an employee. I'm not an agent of Onyx. I'm a customer just like you. I never personally see anything like that or professionally. And to see how we're worked out for the better is, is great. Since then, Onyx has rebounded with, uh, you know, better customer service. Uh, more videos, instructional videos, better resources, and faster shipping times. Even introducing a new model, the CTY2. So let's talk about the future of Onyx. What do you what do you see there? Dude, I was so happy when they started making their instructional videos. Like how to put the battery in the bike. I was like, oh my God, it's exactly what I would do. And we've been missing this. The user manual, awesome. Um, I don't think that company owes us a lot. I think they sell us a bike, they give us a limited amount of support, a limited amount of warranty, and that's fine. You know, we should be out of their hairs. We know what we're signing up for. I think what Onyx is doing today 
that's it. They shouldn't do anything more for anyone else. I think Onyx should just do more for themselves. The better it is for Onyx, the better it is going to be for all of us. And I tell people, this isn't Walmart. You know, Onyx doesn't have to help you. If you're cool with them, they're going to be, and listen, my company, my companies, we have a motto. You need us, we don't need you. This would never change for the most part. That would always be on the menu. The CTY2, the new one, I like that revision. I like the controller on down on the bottom where it can breathe. Um, maybe at another bike, but specializing in something. And that also means if they don't have so much junk to sell, that's one less piece of junk they got to support. So I don't like this idea of like the company customizing the bike because that's every little thing. Uh, like one of the great guys in the beginning, David Shaw would say, everything you sell a customer is something you gotta support. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Buy an Onyx RCR, leave it alone for the first 30 days, make sure everything's cool because that's your warranty, and then go sicko mode. <laughs> do it, do it, race a Tesla, I've done it, it's fun. And learn technicals, you know, like look out for yourself, make some friends, make some, see other people's great impressions and share. You know, um, if you help three people a year with something that helped you with the Euronix, you've more than done enough, you know, do that. So that's our talk with John Angel and how he's quickly grown in a rapidly changing industry. And a big shout out to John and the entire NYC community for helping to pioneer the future of e-bike culture. If you want to dive into more video and tech tips, click the links on the side and remember to like and subscribe so we can help you find tech deals that fit your lifestyle. We'll see you guys in the next video.